this is able to sustain all testicular function, whether that's testosterone production or spermatogenesis within the testicles. Balls will be nice and full on this protocol. Will it be more expensive on top of your TRT or anything there above? Of course it will. But life without big nuts is cumbersome. Vigor, Steve here. Man, I can't believe I have to make this video, but apparently this still comes as a surprise to some people out there. They go on anabolics, they do an oral-only cycle or a SARMs-only cycle or actual hormone replacement therapy, full-blown steroid cycles. And then after four to six weeks, they reach down. They're ready to get busy either by themselves or with a significant other. They reach down and then the balls are gone. <laughs> Completely vanished. Right? Did they retract into your body? Not entirely. They've simply shrunk to the point you can barely see them. This comes as a surprise to a lot of people out there. They didn't do their due diligence researching about the hypothalamic pituitary testes axis, shutting down after administering exogenous hormones that are working through the androgen receptor. Don't worry, Uncle Steve, your online steroid daddy has the solution. Keep watching, you will learn something new. But before we get into it, please like the video, leave a comment for the algorithm and consider subscribing if you haven't already, and if you want to support the channel, you can do so by joining either the YouTube or Patreon memberships, or you can vote for upcoming deep dives, or join the weekly vigorous Q&A, which is always on Saturday. You can ask your questions privately for an entire hour, then we go public, and very likely that it turns into a super chat, super flood. Okay, long story short, you went on cycles and your nuts disappeared. Why? Steve, please tell us why. Well, buddy, exogenous hormones, whether those are anabolic androgenic steroids, selective androgen receptor modulators, or pro-hormones which turn into anabolic androgenic steroids through metabolism, they all have a negative feedback on the hypothalamic pituitary testes axis through the androgen receptor, which some of the anabolic androgenic steroids actually convert into estradiol or methyl estradiol, and then shutting down the HPTA through the estrogen alpha and beta receptors. So now you have two signals that shut you down. Third signal being through the progesterone receptor. Again, some of the progestogenic 19 nor testosterone derivatives, the nandrolone-based steroids can shut you down through the progesterone receptor as well. Then it's also important to highlight that nandrolone acts as a cofactor in the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. Nandrolone is a metabolic intermediate in this conversion process. So if you take exogenous nandrolone, you get down regulation through the androgen receptor, estrogen receptor through the conversion, and the progesterone receptor as well. Keep this in mind, the 19Rs are terrible for your overall HPTA function and testicular volume. Even if you put something in place to sustain certain parts of the HPTA, nandrolone, tristolone, trimbolone, check drops for that matter, when you take that, testicular volume and functioning will go down. I mean, for fuck's sake, tristolone was even developed as a male contraceptive. And all of the female contraceptives out there contain synthetic progestins. Now, I know what you're going to say. SARM only cycles or oral only cycles, excluding Dianabol, which converts into methyl estradiol, lower your estrogen levels. And thus, the negative feedback on the HPTA should be minimal, only through the androgen receptor. But since estradiol levels are going down, you don't get this negative feedback through the estrogen alpha and beta receptors. And thus, luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone secretion should be sustained. And while that might be true, while serum testosterone levels might still stay somewhat elevated in some individuals if they are young, I'm still not an advocate of oral-only cycles or serum-only cycles because with prolonged exposure, testosterone levels and estrogen levels will come down and you still need a little bit of testosterone and estrogen to function normally as a human being, okay? You still need a testosterone and estrogen base for everything that's beneficially associated with these hormones. Even if you go on exogenous testosterone for TRT or HRT, testicular shrinkage will occur unless you put something in place. So let's start discussing that. We can start with the first step of the hypothalamic pituitary testes axis by looking into kispeptin 10. This has been scientifically shown to increase gonadotropin hormone, releasing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone secretion downstream and thus testosterone levels and estrogen levels should stay sustained. The problem is, even though there's some scientific evidence to show this, anecdotal reports are a little bit lackluster. I'm still asking for somebody to show me proof with blood work using kispeptin 10, either on TRT, HRT, or an oral only cycle, showing that luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone levels stay sustained. Has anybody ever heard of kispeptin 10 monotherapy? I think not. Then kispeptin 10 would now be prescribed instead 
of hormone replacement therapy or even HCG monotherapy, which we'll get to a little bit later on. Next on the list is gonadotropin releasing hormone, also known as gonadorelin. That's the brand name for GnRH. This acts on the pituitary gland and causes luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone secretion downstream. Still, I'm waiting for somebody out there to tell me that they're on gonadorelin replacement therapy or gonadorelin monotherapy, proving it with blood work hasn't happened to this day. So the next step we can look into are gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists like busarelin. Desorelin, gosorelin, hysterelin, luprorelin, nafarelin, and triptorelin. Keep in mind that at higher dosages, these can make you sterile. So I don't think that any of these uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists are really a suitable replacement for gonadorelin or kispeptin 10, or even effective in sustaining luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and thus testicular function and size, because the microgram dosages are very, very low, and it's very difficult to find these in anything besides milligram dosages. So please do your due diligence researching. Some of these might be 10 micrograms intranasally, two or three times per day, while other ones might be 25 micrograms subcutaneously, once per day or three times per week, right? It's the difference between the effective dose and the castration dose might be very, very narrow. So I would leave these options off the table. Another thing you can look into is the selective estrogen receptor modulators, tamoxifen, clomiphene, and enclomiphene. The downside of Selective estrogen receptor modulators is that they can lower IGF-1 levels, raise liver enzymes, and might have some negative effect on your clotting factors and overall clotting risk. So I don't think that they're very sustainable. Can you use them to mitigate some side, side effects of gynecomastia formation or for post psychotherapy for four to six weeks in duration? You sure can. But if you're on exogenous androgens or selective androgen receptor modulators or pro-hormones for that matter that are otherwise shutting you down, I don't think that tamoxifen, clomiphene, or even enclomiphene is very sustainable. And as a quick side tangent, tamoxifen metabolizes into endoxifene and afimoxifene, which are the actual selective estrogen receptor modulators. But one of its metabolites, norendoxifene, is actually a very potent aromatized inhibitor. So the benefit of tamoxifen is that you get two separate selective estrogen receptor modulators and one aromatized inhibitor out of it. So not only are you blocking the estrogen receptors in the pituitary gland, you're also lowering serum estradiol levels, reducing the negative feedback that estradiol has on the HPTA. So tamoxifen, there's something to say for it, albeit that'll be the first one to say, every time I see blood work on men using anything over hormone replacement therapy, and they start adding in the tamoxifen, 20 milligrams, even 40 milligrams per day to um, prevent gynecomastia formation, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone don't really go up. Really, even with prolonged exposure, the same can be said for raloxifene, up to 120 milligrams per day, albeit that that raloxifene is a direct serum and doesn't have this aromatized inhibiting metabolite. At very high dosages of tamoxifen or raloxifene, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone don't appear to go up. But on clomiphene and enclomiphene, that seems to be the case. I would still prefer enclomiphene over clomiphene. Um, albeit that it's a reasonably new compound and hasn't been really investigated separately. There's only 100 studies on PubMed when it comes to enclomiphene. It seems that either or 25 milligrams clomid or enclomiphene during hormone replacement therapy uh, up to particular dosages seems to be able to keep luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone somewhat sustained and thus testicular function is insured to a certain amount. Again, if you've got an actual steroid cycle containing trembolone, trestolone, um, nandrolone, check drops, or anything else that's highly suppressive, clomid and clomiphene, it's simply not going to work. But it might still work on an oral steroid-only cycle or an oral SARM-only cycle. Plenty of, well, younglings, unfortunately, run enclomiphene with SARMs or enclomiphene with an oral steroid-only cycle and still have a luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone somewhat in range for testicular function and testicular size. I still don't think it's the right approach. I'm not giving you the green light to follow such a protocol because I feel that exogenous testosterone, a bioidentical hormone that you produce naturally, should be the foundation of all cycles, whether that's TRT, HRT, or something involving a couple other compounds on top of your testosterone base. Now, there's several herbal extracts out there that are said to increase a luteinizing hormone secretion from the pituitary gland and thus um, sustain or improve testicular function, raising testosterone levels, and might even improve overall spermatogenesis and fertility markers. Those are casper extract, maca root extract, fenugreek extract, 
Tribulus teristus extract, ashwagandha root extract, Tonkat Ali extract, and Fadoja agrestis extract. The scientific evidence is a little bit thin. A lot of this is in vitro, in vivo, animal studies, or maybe some anecdotal reports. Um, there's still something to say for using either or a combination of these herbal extracts if you're otherwise drug-free. I mean, herbal extracts don't really qualify you to call yourself on cycle because it's just stimulating luteinizing hormone and downstream testosterone production and spermatogenesis. It's not going to work if you're on cycle. I've never seen anybody do blood work on either of these herbal extracts on exogenous hormones or oral-only cycles and somewhat have LH and FSH levels in range and testicular function sustained. So let's just, um, you know, forego these herbal extracts, even though there's some scientific evidence. Um, I will tell you firsthand, anecdotally in the field, nothing is going to change for your testicular size. So then we have human menopausal gonadotropin, which is a urine purified, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, albeit that from all of the experiments that I've done with blood work on HMG, is that FSH levels come up somewhat, but luteinizing hormone, LH levels, don't really budge. So human menopausal gonadotropin, from all the research that I've done, contains FSH and HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, again, both urine purified. Um, 75 IUs two to three times weekly will bring your FSH levels up and your HCG levels up, in which case the cyclical function might stay sustained to a certain extent. I mean, HMG is very popularly used as a fertility aid, works very well, but I would rather look into recombinant follicle stimulating hormone in combination with recombinant or urine purified human chorionic gonadotropin. Let's say 75 IUs two, three times, maybe even daily, or FSH and 250 IUs to 500 IUs three times weekly of human chorionic gonadotropin. This is able to sustain all testicular function, whether that's testosterone production or spermatogenesis within the testicles. Balls will be nice and full on this protocol. Will it be more expensive on top of your TRT or anything there above? Of course it will. But life without the big nuts is cumbersome. And with this protocol, your balls should be nice and full, filling up an entire hand or mouth, right? Depending on your preference. I guarantee it. Unless you have a varicose cell, which means that the blood flow to your testicles is not optimal. And even if your blood contains a boatload of luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, or human chorionic gonadotropin, these active hormones are simply not getting there. You need to fix this with surgery and you can diagnose this with a testicular ultrasound. So varicose cell aside, adding recombinant follicle stimulating hormone and recombinant or urine purified human chorionic gonadotropin to your protocol will ensure that testicular volume stays sustained. Again, unless you use progestogenic 19 nors, which will downregulate spermatogenesis and testosterone production in the testicles through the progesterone receptor, if exogenous hormone levels are sky freaking high, you'll still get shutdown production within the testicles, no matter how much FSH or ATG you take. We'll get to that a little bit later, don't worry. Now, as a replacement for HCG, you can look into recombinant luteinizing hormone, albeit that it's not readily available. Maybe in the near future, you can go with recombinant FSH and recombinant LH instead of recombinant or urine purified HCG, but for now, the combination of RFSH and RHCG or urine purified HCG seems to be the go-to protocol for testicular function on cycle or anything that revolves around exogenous anabolic compounds. I will tell you this, and this is an old wife's tale, there's not so much scientific evidence to back this up, if any, right? Consider this bro lore at best, Exogenous testosterone at high concentrations appear to be able to permeate into the testicles and stimulate the Sertoli cells. The way that LH and ATG work is as follows. They both increase intertesticular testosterone levels through the combined luteinizing hormone chorionic gonadotropin receptor, the LHCG receptor. So if you activate this receptor with either LH or ATG, Intertesticular testosterone levels go up, and this testosterone travels from the Leydig cells to the Sertoli cells. Actually, a large portion of testicular volume is the Sertoli cells, not the Leydig cells, all contained within the testicles. So the testosterone activates spermatogenesis in the Sertoli cells, and this is heightened or improved, acting as a cofactor in the presence of follicle-stimulating hormone. You could still get spermatogenesis if intertesticular testosterone levels are sufficient enough from the use 
of HCG, for example. But if you take exogenous testosterone to such a high dose, such a high concentration within your body, this high concentration of exogenous testosterone in your body can now permeate into the testicles. And even if the lytic cells are not producing testosterone intertesticularly, the intertesticular testosterone levels still go up from exogenous sources. And thus, the Sertoli cells who can't discriminate from intertesticular testosterone production from the latex cells or exogenous testosterone permeating into the testicles, spermatogenesis will still be induced. Many bodybuilders on testosterone-only cycles, assuming that the dose is high enough, still are fertile <laughs> and still have big nuts. I can attest to this on any dose over 1,000 milligrams exogenous testosterone per week, whether that's 1,000 milligrams per week or 2,000 or 2,500 milligrams testosterone per week, it seems to be over a certain dose of exogenous testosterone, testicular volume goes up and fertility parameters improve. And there's even some scientific evidence to back this up, albeit not on exogenous testosterone. Exogenous provirin or halotestin back in the day were shown to improve fertility parameters in subfertile men. I'll link my uh, steroids versus fertility video series at the end of this one, so you can uh, read all of the scientific evidence that has been performed on provirin and halotestin, but it seems that the commonly accepted bro lore is if the dose of exogenous testosterone is high enough, some of this testosterone can permeate into the testicles, activate spermatogenesis into the Sertoli cells, and somehow, some way, your wife gets pregnant. Oh, and guys, slow down. I know it sounds exciting. Before you start increasing testosterone to a gram per week, Keep in mind that a high dose of testosterone will cause some side effects, including gynecomastia if you don't manage your estradiol levels, might cause hair loss if you don't manage your DHT levels, or acne if you're prone to it and you inject infrequently, or high blood pressure, right? There's a boatload of side effects which can manifest if you increase your testosterone dose high enough. This is why a lot of guys prefer 300, 500 milligrams of test and then adding in a DHT derivative or a 19 or derivative, but... For my personal preference, I would say that high test is still the best if you can manage the side effects that might come along with that. If you want to improve your semen volume even more, look into some of the over-the-counter supplements which are known to improve semen volume. I mean, Gorilla Mind has lock and loads. You don't have to think about it just by lock and loads. I think it's nine capsules per day, and then semen volume will go up if spermatogenesis and overall testicular function is stimulated on cycle with either HCG, FSH, ideally in combination, or if the dose of exogenous testosterone is high enough so it can permeate into the testicles and start spermatogenesis that way. So again, it's not the end of the world. If you're not shrink, there's plenty of solutions that you can look into, um, even though only three of them actually work from this launcher list of options that we can choose from. It's not the end of the world. Um, I was shut down for almost 10 years with intermittent use of HCG, but with prolonged use of HCG on cycle or even in between steroid cycles, doing HCG monotherapy, which is what I'm currently doing um, in combination with FSH, that is, um, testicular volume can actually be very, very nice to the point. Nobody would ever know that you were using steroids unless they look at the rest of your body, right? That is usually a dead giveaway that somebody is on the sauce. All right, I'll leave it here. Food for thought. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Vigor's crew, you guys know what to do. A front double. I got 99 problems, but testicular volume ain't one. Biceps for you guys. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.